I'm happiest in the saddle. <laughs> a fellow sportsman. I am an FBI agent. Great Scott. What do you say we cut the chit chat? A hole. Dogs and cats living together. Mass hysteria. Come with me if you want to live. Hello, and welcome to Retro Rumble. Let's get spooky. I'm Charlie McGee. I'm George McGee. And because it's Halloween, we're obviously doing a Halloween-type film. This yes. time, what is it, George? This time, we're, we're going back to the 80s to do cult classic, cult favourite, The Lost Boys. 1987? Indeed. Richard Donner? Almost. Okay, we'll get to that. I uh, know it was Joel Schumacher. Uh, ju- 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 easy for me to say. Joel Schumacher, but executively produced by Dick Donner. Yeah, so uh, the boys, Kiefer Sutherland, the two Corys. The film that is responsible for giving us the two Corys and their many, many films. Amazing wardrobe, us. some pretty good uh, special effects, some great makeup. Great soundtrack. Amazing soundtrack. And I'd say there's even, there's even some music in this film that we'll be focused on during the podcast. A bit more, a certain type of instrument, perhaps, a certain type of wind instrument. Mm. Anyway, don't, George doesn't know what I'm talking about. No, I don't know that you're talking about the sweaty sax guy. Okay. So, uh, yeah, no, this this episode is, is for Halloween. It was great fun to go back, so we're going to do all the usual things. We're going to go through our first memories, highlights of the film. Uh, well, then there'll be a short coulda, woulda, shoulda. We'll do some suspicious spin-offs. But before we get into it, most of you know what to expect, but for anyone who doesn't, here's George with just a quick bit of housekeeping. Yes, so uh, just a disclaimer that we are film lovers, not professionals, so we, uh, we're we going to be going through this with it. It's a light-hearted look at the, the films of our youth, so we're going to be going through the films in detail, so there will be spoilers from the very off. Uh, there might be some casual use of explicit language, so uh, be mindful if you have small people or easily offended people uh, near, within earshot. Um, and yeah, we, we aim to entertain, we aim to give you some sort of some fun trivia, and just, you know, sit back and enjoy full of spoilers but won't spoil the film and hopefully inspire you to go back and give it a rewatch because it's a great film for this time of year indeed okay so without further ado it's 987 so we're recording this on a walkman or a walkman whilst wearing a saxophone around our neck. whilst on a motorbike yeah very very sweaty and purple pants so um here it is the lost boys 1987 enjoy enjoy Sam have just moved to Santa Carla, California. They're about to discover its secret. Notice anything unusual about Santa Carla yet? No. It's a pretty cool place. If you're a Martian. Or a vampire. When you scream. So where are you? The flying nun! I'm your brother, Sammy. Help me! Stay back! Stay back! What's happening to me, Star? Get yourself a good, sharp stick. Drive it right through his heart. You're a vampire, Michael. My own brother, a damn blood-sucking vampire. Oh, you wait till mom finds out, buddy. When a vampire bites it, it's never a pretty sight. So, George, 1987, The Lost Boys. Who brought us this amazing film that we grew up with? We'll start with who almost brought us this and who executively produced this. So this uh, was originally a Richard Donner project. So Richard Donner, who we've previously covered on, The Goonies. I completely didn't know. This is news to me, listeners. I I thought this was a Richard Donner film. Um, Did he just produce it or something? Yeah, he executively produced it. So it was originally a project for him. And it's a, you can see why, because the original screenplay by uh, Jan Fisher and James Jeremias was about a bunch of Goonies type kids. So the the uh, the vampires were all going to be actually younger. So in America, fifth, sixth grader. So yes, yeah, similar age to the kids in the Goonies. And the Frog Brothers were going to be apparently chubby eight-year-old scouts. So that was the original incarnation. And... Obviously, as the title would suggest, the links to Peter Pan were a lot stronger. So it's sort of that evolution started out of, well, Peter Pan was someone that never aged, that could fly, 
why don't we just make him a vampire? And, nice, and I like lost, it. And so, and him stop all, giving Hollywood ideas, George. And the whole point <laughs> of of him seducing Wendy, the mother, and her two younger brothers, uh, Michael and uh, Sammy. You know, but it's it's. Um, it's so, it's so we can have some company. Is no, but it's, it's, it's Michael. I don't, I don't I can't remember the name of the, the, the brothers in... They've changed the names, but it was Michael and, I think, John in Peter Pan. Um, but, yeah, they've obviously changed... They've, they've, they've tweaked it a bit. But So, yeah, originally it was a, um, a project for Richard Donner, but he had quite a busy slate around that time. And I think probably I'm sort of um, assuming, but I think he was kind of turned off by the idea of, of doing another Goonies type film. And another script uh, caught his attention by a young gentleman called Shane Black. That was Lethal Weapon. So that came out the same year. Thank God he made that decision. It definitely does have, I think, I, I watching this film again, it's been a long time since I've seen this film, but watching it again, and obviously I've watched Goonies more recently, this definitely does stand out as like, this is like a, a horror sequel to the Goonies. Does it stand up as well? Does it, It's obviously not as close to our heart as the Goonies is or anybody else's, but there is a lot of love for this film. And I think the question we're going to try and answer today is how does it stand up today? Because this film was for, was this film forced in us by the Glendinnings? Oh, oh uh, without a <laughs> doubt. Yes. Um, so yeah, um, just to sort of finish up. So yeah, um, because Donna was too busy, uh, he brought on board a music video director called Mary Lambert, and she was responsible for uh, a lot of Madonna videos. One that everyone will remember is Like a Prayer. Right. So she was originally working on it and then left due to creative differences. Okay. I, I'm, I'm doing my air quotes. And then they brought on board Joel Schumacher. And Joel Schumacher was very hot in Hollywood after the success of Brat Pack Classic that I've never seen St. Elmo's Fire. Right. Okay. He was the one that said... Let's drop the, the the Goonies type thing. Let's go for sexy vampires and make them older teenagers. So it was, it was actually it was Joel Schumacher that rewrote the the script with a guy called Jeffrey Bohm, who uh, ironically would also uh, do work on Lethal Weapon, and uh, he also done Inner Space as well. So yeah, they they changed it to yeah make them into sexy teenagers, and obviously for um, which has had a huge impact on on the film and beyond as we're going to. Discuss. I think where it does, uh, you know, from the whatever the production crew were, were obviously going for this, you know, as I think we said in the intro, this film brilliantly captures the zeitgeist of 1987. And for us, obviously, looking back from today, quite hilariously so in, in parts. <laughs> yes. And uh, yeah, so to go back to your point in terms of first memories, um, so get ready to drink, we were introduced this by our good friends and next door neighbours, the Glen Dinnings. But I think for the first time we've mentioned on this uh, podcast, it was actually Catherine Glen Dinning, the oldest Glen Dinning. Yes, the wiser, because it was very much her, she would have been uh, older and it was very mm. much her generation sort of thing. And obviously and the, the uh, Corys, she she was the one who had the obsession with the Corys, I think. She was obsessed. They had a lot of Corey Haim movies. And yeah, she was obsessed with the, the two Corys. But I would say this film is very much geared towards more of a, a female audience than than there isn't much in terms of yeah it's there's it's, one female character and there's a lot of lost sexy boys sexy it, vampires sexy vampires so yes you can you can see why it was uh, it was popular with Catherine and and she sort of forced it on us I think it was out of all the other films that we had on heavy rotation many of which as as you know we've covered on the podcast already but yes the uh, the lost boys was always a a regular fixture at the Glendinning house because it was something that we could all watch together yeah and um, you know, Even though not, I still found it a little bit scary because I was a wimp when we were younger, and you know we are, we're not fooling. We were we were frog marched into that room and we were sat down. Frog marched and, like it. See and, what you've done there. And forced to watch License to Drive, Dream a Little Dream, oh, and God. and uh, obviously this classic. But no, obviously we've got a lot to thank them for. So I don't know. In terms of yeah, first memory is exactly the same for me. It's one of those things. I don't think we watched this film anywhere else other than their house. Um, I don't know. If I we think had you're a, right. I think you're I'm right, not yeah. sure we had a copy of it. Um, but yeah, I think 
it's something we we'll watch it a lot at a certain age and yeah I have not watched this film for a long time and the last time I saw Jason Patrick was uh, in some Speed 2 Speed 2 sequel um, no I was uh, I was thinking about that I forgot because he hasn't had the happiest career the happiest career and apparently uh, in an interview with Joel Schumacher there was a, he did a huge interview with uh, Vulture recently and a very revealing and entertaining interview because Mr. Schumacher does not Mince's words when talking about working with certain people, uh, Val Kilmer, Tommy Lee Jones, etc. So yeah, uh, check that out. But he yeah he touches on uh, Jason Patrick's career and he said he basically he shunned fame. He because he had a his um, he was from a famous family, so his dad was um, one of the priests, the the other priest that's not Max von Sydow in The Exorcist. Okay. So his uh, but his father I think died of a heart attack and he was an alcoholic his his grandfather was Jackie Gleason and yeah in Joel Schumacher's words basically said you know he didn't want to be in the spotlight and he kind of actively sort of ran away from it so he could have been a huge star and obviously fair it, play to him it did wonders for, for Keith the Sutherland for our two friends the two Corys so yeah he's had a kind of a mixed career obviously he's he's still working I mean he was I think one of the best things I've seen him in uh, that I need to rewatch is Narc He's very good in that. Yes, he is. With uh, Ray Liotta. Yeah. God, that, that, when was that? Was that film 90s? No, it was uh, early noughties. I remember it came out. So when, we will uh, get to it in a few years. Yeah, yeah. Give it some time. So, yeah. I mean, I, I think that's what needs to be um, sort of said f- for Schumacher. So, I mean, some of you are prob- should be aware of Joel Schumacher. He's quite a prolific uh, director. He's had some big hits. He's also responsible for arguably one of the worst films ever made. Batman and Robin? Yes, bat, indeed. Batman, cre- bat credit card, anyone? Bat nipples, bat credit card. Yeah, so, but no, he has had some great films. So, done done this in Elmo's Fire. Um, he went on to do Flatliners, Falling Down, which is, you know, a great film. Classic. Um, he did, yeah, he took over the Batman franchise from Tim Burton. So, he did Batman Forever, which we were We both, both agree. We like that. I, I think because yeah. at the time we were in our teens and it was a good film and um, I, enjoy, I enjoyed it. It was, it was just very camp, Sol- solid three stars yes <laughs> but yeah very camp I think it did capture obviously no one's going to get no one's going to outdo Adam West but the campiness of Joel Schumacher did shine through and it was it was good yeah yeah. Was, I mean there is some fun in that and he's also uh, responsible for pre- arguably two of the best John Grisham adaptations so he did The Client and he did A Time to Kill as well which I think is those are the only two I've seen I obviously I've read pretty much all the books have you not seen The Rainmaker with Matt Damon is that with Matt Damon and Danny DeVito uh, possibly I just remember it's being a bit dull it is, it is a bit dull but I know even the book was yeah. a bit dull as well a young up and coming Ma- well, Memphis lawyer against gets taken on by a large large yeah. firm and earns yeah. lots of money but yeah. it's completely corrupt oh, obviously this is the firm as well with Tom Cruise <laughs> um, like every other Grisham novel and yeah then he had some success sort of in the again early noughties uh, with uh, Tigerland and Phone Booth and I think that's the sort of when talking about all those films um, Schumacher really has a talent for casting for discovering, discovering actors yeah. yeah Colin Farrell Kiefer Patrick if he'd stayed on the and Corys our, the, the two Corys oh so, and, and yeah he imagine he, a world with the two Corys hadn't have met exactly exactly no license to drive <laughs> dream a little dream oh my god Roller Boys was there something about Roller Boys Corey was definitely in that. I'm not, are they both in that, though? Hopefully. Maybe. Are we going to have to go back and do Roller oh, Boys? God, no. <laughs> I'm not ready for that. Um, so, yeah, he has a great eye for, you know, spotting talent. And, you know, I say he has, has a very varied career. And I don't think he's done much recently. Apparently, I think the last thing he did, he directed a couple of episodes of House of Cards. But, yeah, he hasn't done a, um, a great deal of stuff recently. But he has had quite, a, I say... A, an interesting career over the past few decades. Great. Was that all the production chat? Are we going to take? Yeah, a, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm done. I'm bored. I'll see you later. <laughs> Should we take you're, a, a, you're a run? Your own. <laughs> George has left the building and been replaced by another version of George. Uh, so we're going to take a retro ramble through the film. So, am I right in thinking this film starts with a montage? 
pretty much every 80s film should do no no it's it's a it's a bit of a cold open because it i oh, know it's the sorry is there's some vampire action yeah it's the uh they're on the the merry-go-round and there's lots of lots of mullets and uh yeah it's a bit of a yeah i say it's, it's an 80s montage but then it's the, the the that grumpy security guard gets picked off of course yeah there is that there is a kind of cold open the introduction of the of the floaty fly cam that we see a lot in this film yeah sorry i uh, just give some uh, context to a Cold Open is a bit of a, a film term. It's the you know uh, the Bond films sometimes call them a pre t- a pre title sequence or but yeah it's sort of like a an opening sort of uh, you know a prologue of sorts an unexplained uh, part of the film yeah but yes being a classic eighties film we get a proper montage of of the family arriving in uh, in Santa Cruz oh, sorry just, sorry Santa Carla I just thought there was something really weird in that do you notice that like they're all in the car and listening to music and then by the end of the montage Michael's on a motorbike. <laughs> It's yeah. just a weird thing. It's like, was the motorbike on the back? Because I think he does he buy it or does he during the in? I'm just saying. In it's a very mon- it's a very quick montage. In, it's a quick montage, and he somehow upgrades. He, he's in the back. He's in the back seat, or he's in the he's in the car. And then at the end of the montage, he pulls up next to the car on a bike, and I was like, when did he get the motorbike? Don't worry, it's the '80s. Everyone had motorbikes. Yeah, but I think the question on everyone's lips is, what the hell is Corey Haim wearing? Oh my God, Corey Haim's wardrobe in this film. Throughout this film is is fantastic. It is, um, I think the word you're looking for is fabulous. Fabulous. I mean, it's 80s through and through. I just feel like throughout this film, and it's really on the nose at one point when he puts that, uh, I don't know, hair, hair piece on or hat sort of thing. He thinks he's Molly Ringwald. Yes, and yes. there is obviously post. I think there's a poster for Sixteen Candles, or is it the Breakfast Club? I can't remember in his room. There's also a poster in his a very sexy Rob Lowe picture. And now I w- I have made made a note of this saying why is there a sexy picture of Rob Lowe in a teenage boy's bedroom? But apparently that is a, a Joel Schumacher reference because Rob Lowe was in St Elmo's Fire. Right. Okay. Um, that would explain it. And I think Mr. Schumacher just thinks you know Rob's hot. Get him up on the wall. Yeah. Why not? Why not? It's a teen heartthrob. And I like, I think, something that we that, that comes up a bit in the first few lines of dialogue is the economic uh, exposition. But Sammy, we're broke. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, okay, that's it. And it's kind of explained a few times that they've arrived. They've I, got, I need to get a job. <laughs> that they arrive with nothing. Um, yeah, wait a minute. And then, because obviously we've been introduced to the sexy, sexy vampires, um, they don't actually say a lot. And if they, uh, if Kiefer Sutherland does say anything, the sentence is punctuated with... Michael. Michael. Meg, it's such a sexy, whispery voice. Yeah, according to IMDb, uh, the <laughs> Michael is said 118 times throughout the film. It is... it is. Uh, there there are times oh my God, that just, is a dangerous drinking game that you've just unlo- you've unleashed. <laughs> there, there is times where there's just, there's, there's like, there's just echo. Michael, Michael, Michael. Michael. <laughs> <laughs> I did. It does seem to be um, hammered on, but sexy vampires. And wait a minute, is that John Bon Jovi? Yeah, oh, lovely mullet. And obviously, you've got uh, Alex Winter, also known as uh, Bill from Bill and Ted. Marco, Ma- Marco. <laughs> Tony, it's, it's it's like the models from Zoolander again, isn't it? Or, or the terrorists from Die Hard. You have got Marco, Co- Tony. Yeah, they got they got some name, but they got amazing hair. And this, I don't know. I just think they look like a they look like a poison support group or like Skid Row. Or th- but that was those. Was this Qu- was the Quiet Riot. This 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 was the movement of the. Uh, this was the moment. You know, it was was it pure soft rock. It was oh, like yeah. not hard rock, not like heavy metal. Not uh, this Co- was cock rock, <laughs> <laughs> leather cock. Lo- cock rock uh, anyway and I've, yeah, I've just made a note you know uh, Jason Patrick is a classic 80s teenager um, the fact that he looks like he's in his 30s yeah I was going to say that yeah it's like it's like Sammy and like when he's talking he's like you could almost be dating your mum <laughs> are we really supposed to believe what 17 are we saying yeah because how, how old was he when he made this who will have been uh, oh he must have been in his mid 20s but he definitely it, looks it, it is the sort of the guy like from Beverly Hills 90210 it's like he looks yes very much so Brandon you look about 35 but then we are very quickly, you know, speaking of montages, speaking of Jason Patrick, sexy vampires, we're getting to a whole bunch of sexiness where we're probably going to spend the most of this podcast talking about the greased up sax guy. Sweaty sax man. I think he deserves his own podcast episode. I still believe. <laughs> I still believe. I mean, the camera loves this guy. It really lingers on him. Let's just, let's just, for those of you who can't remember Sweaty Sass Guy, because I'd forgotten about him. Had you? 
No, no. Um, it's, George uh, is into sax. <laughs> no, just just to give you. George bit. is into sweaty sax men. I mean, what can I say? I ha- everyone has a vice. Mine is sweaty <laughs> sax guys, um, especially ones that gyrate in purple leather trousers. Um, but no, uh, this is a bit of a running joke um, in my office. Uh, so uh, uh, but you're a sweaty sax man. I am a sweaty sax man in my spare time. Yes, that's right. You're a sax pest. Uh, sax pest. <laughs> um, but no, my uh, one of my work uh, friends, Sam. Uh, this is one of her favorite films. And we frequently have Sweaty Sax Man uh, on YouTube clips on on uh, repeat. And as I was telling you uh, yesterday, some uh, genius on YouTube has created a, a five minute edit of Sweaty Sax Guy with Jason Patrick just staring at him, him <laughs> lovingly. So in the film, you've got Jason Patrick staring at... Doing a little bit of stalking. Doing a bit of stalking, just staring at a star. Yeah. Um, but what this uh, this very clever person, I can't remember who, who it is... Um, but they basically just edited her all out. So it's just, you've just got Jason Patrick <laughs> looking hungrily at Sweaty Sax Man <laughs> for about, as I say, five minutes. But let's just talk about his getup. So, um, so like long hair, greasy mullet. Long, greasy mullet, check. Yeah. Um, Bulging silk, muscles. Bulk, uh, he's, he's really well built. Wouldn't mess with sw- Sweaty Sax Man. Oh, you take care of your body. I wouldn't want to meet him in an unhealthy way. <laughs> Especially with a saxophone. <laughs> um, yeah, so obviously he's got a saxophone and he's wearing some serious bling, some silver beads. Uh, no, I think he's got like a metal, like is it a, a chain, bike, a bike lock <laughs> <laughs> round his waist with, as I say, purple leather trousers. There's yeah. lots of flames to accentuate his glistening body. Oh no, I've gone again. Yep. And if you want to talk about like a, just a cheese dream of George's, uh, Saturday Night Live have actually done a sketch which involves a sweaty sax man. And it's no other th- no other than uh, George's man crush, John Hamm. Jo- Delicious John Hamm. It's just really worrying when you look at George's computer and see how many times he's watched the uh, SNL video featuring a sweaty John Hamm. Well, but, you know, it's... Uh, well, we always say this, but we'll put a link on the, uh, on the blog. Uh, but yes, that is a very bizarre and uh, funny Saturday Night Night Live sketch. But I, I, like I said before, this film capturing, you know, what was going on in 1987, it's a rock festival on the beach and it's come what may. I mean, there's some pretty heavy handed metaphors in this film. Drugs are bad. Drinking is bad. Um, you'll turn into a vampire, basically. But it, it it was very much a rock. You know, this this was what was going on. This is what people would be doing. It was it was motorbikes. There was no cell phones. It was just motorbikes and rock, rock. That's all you needed. Yeah, a, a, a life. Steady. It was a simpler time, and and um, preferably a saxophone as well. I'm trying to find the name of this guy. Yeah, it, Tim Capello is the guy, uh, the sweaty sax man. I love it. Are oh, you making it sound like you didn't know it? Um, <laughs> and I've had to look. This up <laughs> and uh, apparently he performed with a legendary diva Tina Turner throughout the 80s and 90s. Wow, so uh, I think I saw him. He actually cropped up in like some uh synth wave electro video uh, in animated form. So, uh, I mean, I think the guy is a bit of a, a legend, a cult legend. Okay, yeah. Getting back to the film, though, the one point I really liked was the um, missing poster of the security guard still in his security card uniform. <laughs> <laughs> just to make clear, he was a security guard and he's missing. Because you think when people are, like, missing, you just put, like, a nice photo of, you know... Yeah, have you seen him? A family shot. Yeah. But, yeah, he's in full security guard get-up. Just, no, he's in, he's in his costume. Maybe, maybe, maybe it makes sense. Um, did we wear... I mean, because it's weird. You've got the whole rock get-up and people dressing like, you know, they're in a soft rock band, like, as I say, Skid Row, Poison, whatever you want to call it. But, but on the other side, you've got, uh, obviously, the Frog Brothers, and then you've got Corey Hames, amazing Technicolor dream Again, coat. what is he wearing? In every, in every scene. I also that, get... Have you that bathrobe? he's got is that a bathrobe it's, yeah. it's like he's wearing a bathrobe or a dress, a dress. I'm, I'm not i'm not sure but um do you think the, he brought his own wardrobe i that's that's what i wanted i want i wanted to ask because you get the feeling throughout like when he's delivering his lines and that it's like he's in another film mm. it's almost like he's been told you're in the sequel to breakfast at, you know breakfast club you're in you're in the sequel to 16 candles because he's he's dressing like molly ringwald and he's putting on this getup. And whenever he's talking to Michael, he's like, Michael, it's like he, we're interrupting his day. 
Yeah. I get the feeling that we're into... It's like that's his kind of delivery mechanism. But was this the first Corey's love-in? Yeah. So, um, obviously, Corey, uh, Corey Feldman had been in, in Goonies and a few things. But this was, I think, yeah, the first sort of film that they were in together. And they obviously bonded uh, on set and became close, close friends and colleagues. But this... Uh this film, you've obviously got the, you know, the different timelines. What, how is everyone fitting in? You know, mum's got a job and starts dating her I need boss. Need a job. <laughs> Cute little mum. And yeah, obviously Corey's trying to get in with uh, the Frog Brothers. Hey man, read this. I told you, I don't like horror comics. Think of it more as a survival manual. There's a number on the back, and pray you never need to call us. I'll pray. I never need to call you. Sure. That that voice that Feldman puts on is it was his voice breaking? Or, I mean, it's it's put on through. I mean, it's it's classic classic Feldman, isn't it? It's yeah. Sort of like, um, I mean, they, they are for me. They are the highlight of this film. You know, yeah. they are hilarious. Uh, the Frog Brothers, um, and apparently uh, Schumacher um, encouraged them to, when they was like saying, "Oh, well, you know, how should we look? What's our approach?" And he was like, "Just watch a bunch of stupid action films with Chuck Norris and Stallone." So that's why the, you know the sort of the the army fatigues, the bandana, and stuff like that is all very much linked to none other than John Rambo, our last podcast episode. Yeah, and that's why we wore a lot of bandanas. So still uh, do. I can't remember how many. I still t- believe. <laughs> I still believe. I can't remember how many uh, nights out it takes for them for Michael. 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 Just you, Michael. Um, before Michael gets in with the wrong crowd, because I was talking about heavy-handed metaphors, and this film is like this is what happens when you get in with, with the, the wrong r- crowd. Yeah. So we have the night where um, Michael is turned up by being bitten on the neck, no. just by drinking some mm. cheap wine. Mm, cheap wine. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I've I've said considering he has so little dialogue, and I think it's sort of yeah, nost- nostalgia sort of kicking. It's like Keith Sutherland doesn't really do much in this film. It's, it almost seems criminal how little he's in it. I worked but out he's so bloody charismatic. I know. I mean, he's just there, and uh, you know, scary bad guy. But what's what's crazy is that you know the spoiler alert: the head vampire guy, um, mum's boss. What's his name? Max. Max. Yeah, Max. Um, he's in this film more. And he has much more lines um, than Kiefer Sutherland. Yeah. Know? So it's, yeah, it's, I think looking back, as you say, was with nostalgia, that almost seems criminal, but he's amazing. Kiefer Sutherland, you can see why, just what a talent and just so softly spoken, Michael. What a, what a voice. What a ruddy voice. So we get to... Uh, well, we've got the... Yeah, so we've, we've got that turning scene with the very iconic, uh, I mean, it was even referenced in... V- vampire comedy what we do in the shadows in terms of the the worms and the maggot scene i remember yeah. that always used to freak me out when, yeah uh, when i was a kid yeah me too it's just the squ- squirminess you don't like rice tell me michael how could a billion chinese people be wrong <laughs> <laughs> come on how are those maggots <laughs> maggots michael you're eating maggots how do they taste but it all starts when he tokes on a joint. That's the first thing. Oh, he takes well, drugs are bad. Drugs are bad. Then he has a drink. Drinks. Drink. Mm. Drinking is bad. But um, is it just me? But I was kind of getting the sort of thing. There is an, an un like declared love between David and Michael. Well, I, that's what I'm saying. What What does joining Kiefer's club entail? I mean, is it just about vampires? I mean, they're all boys. All boys. <laughs> yeah, and they're not really interested in Star, are they? She's no. just hanging around. Yeah, so it's like it's almost like she's bait. Yeah, she's bait to get Michael. It was Michael that they wanted all the time. Now I'd like to talk about the special effects of Michael falling, which I think I don't. It, maybe you didn't pick up on this. Maybe I was in a different mood. But you know, they're obviously they're they're under the bridge. Yeah. And then when he drops, it's like basically he, the camera work is that he's he looks like he's falling, but it, you can tell if you look at he's it now. He's just lying on something. No, he's just standing and he's standing with his arms like you know, like you do an airplane as a kid. Oh, oh and he's right. doing that okay. and the smoke and this is the Madonna. This is the Madonna f- uh, music video. Yeah. That's when when you said that it makes so much sense. And if if you watch that again, it's hilarious because like all of the effects, it's like he's just standing. You know, he's well. That's it. Yeah, that whole sort of turning sequence is just like again, it's another montage and it's proper eighties music video. And yeah, and it's um yeah, it won't surprise you that as part of because obviously this film has a a great eighties soundtrack and lots of bands like In Excess and stuff on it. But as part of getting them on board, Schumacher uh, said in return, I'll direct some music videos for you. So f- for a few of the bands that have done music. 
Schumacher would go on to make videos for them. Yeah, because I, I don't know what it was like, how much of this you remember. I just always remember the third act. Uh, that's that's all, all I can remember. I remember is, the maggots. Yeah, I, 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 I can, remember the sweaty sex guy. I, I didn't remember the sweaty sex. I can't believe I forgot. I forgot. Um, what, what was his name? Tim Tim Capello. Tim Capello. Um, I still believe. <laughs> but yeah, it's but the music. Yeah, I, I kind of I remember the music more than the Cry plot. Little sister. Uh, four times. Well, 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 you know, it's well, yeah, we'll we'll loop it in. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a classic. It's a classic song. And it's what everyone says it like in the, I think... Is that on our Retro Ramble playlist on Spotify? Uh, I mean, yes. It needs to be added Yes, on. yes, it is. Uh, uh, is I he, still, says, he says is, adding it via his is, phone. I still believe. Uh, is that actually a song or was the, it... The very best of Tim Capello. <laughs> I think it was just... The done. sounds of Tim Capello. I think it was just done for the film. Hear board. the sweat. So Michael's been turned and is a half vampire, right? Yeah, half vampire. I mean, he, is that because he only drank the blood and he wasn't bitten? Yeah, and he needs to he needs to feed to, yeah. to properly turn. Um, but I mean, I do. You know, you've said that um, Corey Haim feels like he's in a different film, and uh, yeah, I'm sure we'll have uh, Catherine Glendening hunting us down. But um, how dare you? Yeah, I mean there. Uh, there is some of the some of the banter between him and Michael does is really funny. You know, yeah, sort of, it works. Just you wait till Mum finds out you're you're shit at eating my vampire. own my own my own brother a blood sucking vampire. Yeah, yeah, I mean, some of it's funny, but some of it is a bit clunky. Some of it, as you say, it, if it kind of feels like he's trying a little bit too hard. But I suppose it's his, you know, it's his breakout young sort of yeah, young actors. You yeah. know, you, you're never sure what you're going to get, um, and but, he's a little bit annoying. Yeah, but I think it's kind but of... Is, is he supposed to be that annoying younger brother thing anyway? Yeah, so. I think it's like, it's meant to be that dynamic and I think it creates the conflict so that, but when something serious does happen, they, these brothers look out for each other. Man. Family. Yeah, it's the most important thing. But um, yeah, I think, because I think Patrick's delivery, I think he does well, but as I say, the, the age difference, I was just like, <laughs> it didn't occur to me when we were younger, but now that it does, it does look like there's, there's a big difference. Um, but if we look at the plot, it is all about um, Michael, 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 um, Michael, and lots of flying. It's like, it seems yeah, they're cool to be a vampire. Well, that's that was the uh, what well, that was a tagline. Was it sort of like sort of sleep all day, party all night, never grow old? It's fun to be a vampire. I think yeah. is the the tagline. I should say, yeah, it's it's, it's pretty cool. And I th- I think in some ways, you know, I do like the that point of view of zooming in when they're like flying down and preying on people. But it's ironic in a way that you know I used to be scared of this film when I was well because I was watching it when I was too young. But now watching it, I felt that they could have dialed up the horror elements. That they could have. It was all. It leans more into the comedy, and you don't actually see much like horror gore type. It's, it's more. It's more kind of. Um... And they keep reusing that same swooping in on people, and then ah, and then it just cuts to black, sort of type thing. Yeah, I guess that's to get the the so rating the, in terms of the rating. But yeah, I've I felt that. I mean, it's kind of gory. Uh, it's, I mean, yeah, the, 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 the stabbing of the yeah. vampires, and it is kind of like is is gory the word I'm looking for? Where it's just all, it's just a bit squeamishy. Yeah, it's more squeamish. that type of than. But you're right. I think it could have been darker. But maybe for the time, apart from the sweaty sax man and Corey Hay, maybe it was seen as quite a dark. Yeah, and I film. suppose they 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 uh, they want to make it sort of as accessible, and I suppose it kind of links back to that origins of being a Goonies esque tale. It needs to be more sort of light hearted with the odd bit of scares thrown in as as the 80s was very good at you know obviously we've talked about with with ghostbusters you know doing a horror comedy is it's a you know it's a tough tightrope to 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 walk but this i think this the reason why this film was successful is because it did it, as i say it was very much a film of the moment well we, we, we co- we've covered the the touchstones for its success you've got sweaty sax guy i mean um you've got great soundtrack yeah great beautiful cast up and coming new new fresh yeah. actors and a director who knows you know what what people want how to make it sort of bombastic finger on the pulse yeah but apart from the obviously i remember these things as as i say going through it again but for me the 
you know, it's a very the th- the first act is very much just introducing everyone. The second act is Michael turning. But for me, I just always, I always remember it's just the the third act, the 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 home invasion. Well, I uh, I remember the dinner party scene where they're sort of they're testing Max, and it's a good switcheroo because garlic doesn't work. Yeah, exactly, garlic doesn't work. But I, I still don't know why the mirror thing doesn't work. Am I? Is that because he's just been invited into the house? That's how it's explained. Yeah. Yeah, and I think yeah, there is some some good horror editing, and there's some good with the dog, with uh, yes, Thorn. Yes, that is a really good scene actually. And anybody who's not f- big fan of dogs probably doesn't like that scene because it's quite yeah, it's it's quite vicious. Yeah, but yeah, there there are I say the bits with the uh, the Frog Brothers is is a lot of fun, and yeah, I say it becomes quickly becomes a a home invasion movie, and I think this is why. Again, yeah, it's become a beloved cult classic for uh, so many people because death by stereo and... It's well shot. It's well shot. It's all like red light and it's, it's an enclosed space. It's like, well, we've got to close close all the shutters. I'm not sure why because mm. the vampires don't like it. It's like they'll come at night. But yeah, it's a great scene and, it's, and you get to see the sort of A-team because A-team would have been in its heyday at the time. Of them preparing the traps, the, yeah. You know? The, 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 the uh, I love the bit where they um, they go into the church to get steal all the holy holy yeah. water, and, and people just like, are just yeah. people are wearing lots of interesting eighties clothes and, and just course. looking down on them. Um, the vampire coming out of the fireplace, I don't understand, but it looks cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Well, why not? And John uh, Bon Jovi getting his final comeuppance. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, and well, that's it. There's some. It's really sort of. That's when there's a bit more horror esque. Yeah, yeah, it's it's quite. There's the, there's the, the bit where the, the like the pipes are exploding and you know where yeah. the guys like boiling in the in the yeah. bath and stuff. I mean, we have skipped over the death of Marco, which is uh, oh, you mean uh, when uh, they disturb them when the vampires are sleeping in, in, in their the den. cave. Yeah. yeah, well, yeah. Apparently, there's a there's a bit when. Um, yeah, Keith Sullivan's uh, chasing them and he's grabbing Corey Hay. And he gets burnt. And he gets sun. burnt. And then there's like a single tear. Um, and apparently that was, um, they kept that in, but it was apparently Keith Sullivan's uh, contact lenses were irritating his eyes. But they're like, oh, that's really poetic. The way you guys like, no, these, these contact lenses are just doing my head in. Maybe that's what it's because I think it really does come out in this third act, and you know you're talking about the contact lenses, but amazing makeup. Yeah, good, good, creature, good vampires, good vamping out. Yeah, and yeah, again, that's a bit with uh, with Max. Uh, the bo- the boys need a mother again. You know, sort of uh, Peter Pan reference, but great. Yeah, that the way he turns around and he's yeah. The, <laughs> Charlie's just pulled a great face. <laughs> um, <laughs> It is a lot of fun. It's, it is. It's quite a short film, isn't it? But I suppose it's. It, it, it ticks. All, it needs to be. It I needs think, to be being a, a comedy. Yeah, it's. It, it needs. It doesn't want to go on too long, and it is sort of setting up for the for the showdown. But it does. It fills. It. it I think it ticks a lot of boxes. It, it's. It's a perfect popcorn film. It's a great date movie because the, all the girls want to go to see it for the hot guys, for the hot young guys and the hot middle aged guys playing teenagers. Um, oh, I thought you were just saying the hot middle aged guy that's with the saxophone. <laughs> <laughs> it all comes back to sweaty sax man all the um, lead back so yeah I enjoyed going back to it as I say not as much love for this as for the Goonies but I think that's probably just because when we were younger as you say I think we were maybe a little bit scared of this when we were young young sort of and I think it's it's fair to say and as, as uh, our, our listeners can probably guess we have more of a love for action than, than horror no but I think I think I, li- I like eeriness I like thought provoking and I think one of my my type of horror would be something like Jacob's Ladder like a very psychological smart, sca- yeah smart s- horror that, that, but still scares the shit out of you but no I don't like the jumpy jumpy make because you just I, I, I find it difficult to suspend belief I mean each to their own but I mean I think there are as many people out there that love this type of horror as much as we love silly action yeah indeed indeed it's funny that this uh, this film was you know such a hit that a, a sequel wasn't made or there were there were some direct to dvd sequels i think 2008 and 2010 these are oh, this is news to me i didn't know that because i was going to ask the question how come there's no sequel well it was uh, set up for a sequel so you may have noticed that david keith keith Sullivan is impaled on antlers and doesn't disintegrate or nothing happens to him he just sort of lies there and they were kind of setting that up for a sequel that he actually isn't dead Right. And uh, Schumacher's idea, he wanted to make a sequel called, (gasps) wait for it, The Lost Girls. And it was going to be, I think David was going to turn a a bunch of girls and Schumacher made several attempts during the 90s to try and get a a sort of sequel off the ground. And he said the 
the studio were trying to push for just another one about a gang of boys. And he was like, the Corys are too old. All the, the other characters are dead. It, do it with gorgeous teenage biker chicks. It'll be great. But he's like, but nobody listened to me. I think maybe it was a dodge bullet. But apparently they had the, um, the director DVD sequels, which is like, we can't get Keith Sutherland, but we've got Angus Sutherland, his younger, less successful brother. <laughs> wow. And yeah, they obviously get the, the, the Corey's back. I think Corey Feldman's in it more than Corey Haim. But yeah, apparently they're, they're pretty awful. What did, how did you feel go about watching it? I enjoyed it. I mean, I enjoyed it, as I say, not being too critical. I can see, to me, it's still a good film. Uh, I'm not sure if it is the best vampire film out there, I think. Uh, we've, we've talked about it before, and it's something that you and I both said we want to revisit. Um, the, it shares a lot of similarities with film came out the same year, Near Dark, which was uh, Catherine Bigelow, who we've, yeah. we talked about, who did Point Lance Break. Henriksen. And Bill Paxton. Yeah. Um, which is a very good, yet yeah, neo sort of uh, vampire. It's almost like a, a Western, modern Western, but with vampires. And once again, the characters in that are even slightly older again. Yes. Yeah. 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 I say that came out the same year. And I think that is a, a better film. Obviously, it's not as, it's a lesser seen film. Um, but yeah, I think that's a good sort of companion piece to this. But in terms of this film, yeah, it was a lot of fun to go back. There's, it has got some some good comedy in it. Um, it's got, you can see why such a beloved cult favourite in terms of the soundtrack, the the one-liners, the, the actors in it. And arguably, thinking about it, how influential it's been in terms of that, the, the whole teen vampire is like a subgenre in itself. And uh, Josh, Josh Whedon, um, who created Buffy, has openly said, yeah, I, I took a lot of inspiration from the Lost Boys for creating Buffy. So, and I'd argue that this is, you know, without Lost Boys, you wouldn't have Twilight. You wouldn't have, you know, any of these sort of more modern sort of sexy vampires. It's weird because I think, I mean, obviously, I'm sorry, I might offend people here. And I know the books are very good, but I'd actually say Twilight's probably the weakest of all of the vampire films we've been given. If you look at the likes of Blade, Buffy, and Lost Boys, and Near Dark. So it's it's yeah. crazy that that will have made probably the most money. Oh yeah, without a doubt. But yeah, I think that's it. I mean, obviously the the whole Dracula vampire law is always going to be sort of rooted in that sort of sexiness because it's you know all about biting people on necks and adolescence, everlasting love and stuff. But yeah, I mean, I think that's it. This, this it is a very important film. You're looking at the '80s and you're looking at key films of the '80s. I think you know this has to be included. And if you're looking for a film to watch this Halloween, it's a great film to go back and watch. I think it ticks the box for me in terms of nostalgia. We have a lot of happy memories associated with this film, and going back and revisiting it is you know yeah. I think that's it with with Halloween. I think well, whereas some people will go out for all out horrors, I think yeah, you, you and I, and as we've we've done on previous Halloween episodes, you know, we like a bit of comedy thrown in. So you know, whether it's stuff like Gremlins, Ghostbusters, it's, uh, I say horror comedies, they're they're difficult. Good ones are difficult to come by. Yeah, agreed. So I mean, that's the review out of the way, which leads us neatly into coulda woulda shoulda. Your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could, they didn't stop to think if they should. Just to explain Coulda, Woulda, Shoulda is where we talk about uh, the actors or directors considered but not chosen for the film. So yeah, we've talked about who almost directed it, Richard Donner and uh, Mary Lambert. But yeah, the, because I say um, Schumacher was such a, has a sort of knack for, for casting and obviously there's the, the casting director and this is really showing my, my geek sort of uh, status. I think it's Marion uh, Doherty who was uh, casting on Tim Burton's Batman as well. Okay. So, so yeah, I think credit has to go to the, obviously the casting director as well as Joel Schumacher. But I think they were pretty much decided on on that the key cast but the most interesting one i could find was for the the role of max and apparently they had approached a guy called fred gwyn and that name probably means nothing to you but if i not said, a sausage he played herman munster from the munster show oh my god so and he's very in terms of the like 
the size, the size, the face. He's very similar to the guy that plays Max. But I think that if you'd cast Herman Munster as as Max, it might have been more of a, a dead giveaway that he was the head vampire. <laughs> Do you want to go out on a date? <laughs> um, um, come over to my house. <laughs> so yes, a very brief coulda, woulda, shoulda. But I mean, you can't really, you know, you couldn't cast anyone else than the two Corys. No. And what, I think this film, rather than who wasn't considered, it was who was discovered. So that was coulda, woulda, shoulda and next up we have our suspicious spin-offs i'm very interested because we we talked briefly about about sequels but uh do you have any uh suspicious sax guy sax guy (laughs) damn it okay so uh, who's how did the sax guy get a hold of the saxophone how did, he, he, how, how did he get there? Does, I just on tour. Where, where, where's he going next? <laughs> no. Yeah, all I can think about is Ready, Sacks Guy. But yeah, as, as we, we've always talked about, there's obviously some mileage for a prequel of seeing yeah. Keitha, you know, maybe even doing it sort of almost like Rebel Without a Cause, you know, 1950s yeah. uh, teenagers. That could be interesting. That's what, I, what I'd like to, why I was asking you about a sequel is... I just think it's it's crying out for a sequel set in a different decade. You yeah. know, like this, and you could pick any decade. They've gone. This is so eighties, so wonderfully eighties. But um, well, that's I, it. You could do period pieces. It could be, you know, it was like almost like a bit like a sort of a Guardians of the Galaxy in terms of like you could have it set in the seventies with a great seventies soundtrack. You could again do a period piece now in the 90s you know so it's i say it's or a western like uh like even go back even further you know sort of thing maybe not so much about kids but i just i I like the idea of this um you know new new family or new or people moving to an area and it being a gang you know like a gang of uh and that you join the gang thinking that you want to be in the gang but actually you don't realize that the gangs are monsters or vampires Mm. i think that that's that's a good story that could be retold and it could be done differently so i would have liked to have seen that uh and then in terms of obviously a spin-off show every week they meet it's the frog brothers (laughs) frog brothers and uh closing music by you know, sweaty sex guy. Yeah. Um, no, one thing I, I, I did mention that it's, I mean, it's a minor thing, but I really like it from a production design point of view. I really like the, the whole, uh, the, the vampire lair that, that, that's because of an earthquake, it's a sunken hotel, I think. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think that's really cool. That's, that's, that to me screamed very much, uh, Goonies. It, it looked, it was that sort of like underground, but oh, like, it's clearly a set. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, no, I think there's a lot, there's a lot to say that works well in this film. I think from the soundtrack to the makeup, to the cast, the plot works, it's simple enough. Uh, so I think that's why I would argue that it's, it still stands up to repeat viewing. Yes, it's it certainly has dated, but obviously it has a, a certain charm of the. I say, you know, it uh, sums up the eighties for all good and bad reasons. Uh, so, kids, stay stay in school. Don't do drugs. <laughs> Don't drink blood. Yeah, unless it's Kiefer Sutherland's. I love that guy. Uh, so that was the Lost Boys. Um, George, what have we got coming up? What people got to look forward to? Should we? Is well, there anything else we need to mention? Well, I, I actually have mentioned the film that we're going to be covering already in this podcast. We are going to be getting our lethal weapon on. Can't wait to do that. Getting too, I'm getting too old for this. <laughs> too old for this shit. Uh, um, yeah, the film that started the franchise, a great film, a great Richard Donner film um, that gave us Mel Gibson, more Mel Gibson, sorry. More, more mullets. And more mullets. And mullets getting a little bit shorter. We're getting closer to the 90s, yeah. a bit more refined. Um, but yeah, no, I'm, I'm very much looking forward to it. So this film will be to get, will be coming out, um, to get you in the mood for Christmas. Theory. Yeah. This will be coming out. Uh, so lethal weapon episode will be coming out early December, late, late I, November, I, I, yeah, late November, early December, uh, right about black Friday when you're all going nuts and looting. Um, so yeah, I think there's nothing else we need to mention. Obviously you can get us on all social media channels. Our blog is available, um, at retro ramble dot blog. Um, we're on Spotify. Spotify, a cast, wherever you get your podcast. Anything else you want to mention, George? Uh, always mandatory, you know, uh, if you do enjoy this podcast, please uh, leave us a review on iTunes. It makes us more visible to more people, uh, pushes us up on on sort of, yeah, when you're looking at iTunes. So, um, or, you know, just uh, spread the word. Yeah, I think I think more importantly, rather, you know, it's it's sharing it with people that like 
and enjoy this sort of things yeah so, and yeah you know um you know thanks go out to all the people that have left reviews for us and you know share our stuff and like all our inane stuff that we're, we're sharing we share a lot of uh, sort of memes and stuff on facebook so follow us on facebook and if keep you're not doing so and keep the suggestions coming we don't obviously follow all of them and we do have a set list of films that we're going to cover but we really appreciate it and it does help us decide uh, what to cover next yes we are in the process of sort of ironing out a rough sort of uh, schedule for for 2020 so yes if you do have any uh beloved films that you'd uh, think should get the retro ramble treatment uh get in touch let us know and if you're in the newcastle area in early december december the 3rd we will be doing another live show um where it will be another film that we've covered before but a christmas special where it will be die hard so if you're in the northeast of england uh we obviously do have some events planned for for london at some stage but if you're in the northeast this around uh, december the 3rd uh come down to the punchbowl hotel uh bobbix where we'll be showing in a very intimate auditorium a showing of die hard um, so I don't think there's anything else to mention no no not at all so this has been Retro Ramble uh, I've been Charlie McGee I've been George McGee and we'll see you next time bye 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 bye